All right, we're on to our fourth video of Biological Basis of Behavior. We're going to start with Module 13, Brain Hemisphere Organization and the Biology of Consciousness. Okay, um, first of all, there's this, your brain consists of two hemispheres, which you already know, and it's joined together by a structure called the corpus callosum, which is a bunch of white matter um, that runs through the middle of your brain. And its job is not just to hold your brain together, but its job is also to send messages between your right and left hemispheres. One of the theories we have on severe epileptic problems where people have seizures is that that amount of messaging going between the two hemispheres somehow collides with one another and causes problems, so it causes the seizures. And so one of the solutions was actually to cut the brain in half at the corpus callosum, so it would separate the left and the right hemisphere. Myers and Gaziniga, Gaziniga, that guy, uh, were two researchers, and there was some interesting phenomena happen when we have a split brain patient. One of the experiments would be we would sit them in front of a screen and we'd make them stare at a dot in the center and we'd flash the word heart, divided H-E on the left side of the dot and A-R-T on the other side where it says heart. Um, but if you'll notice, the way we see things is we look, there's a pencil, there's an apple, both eyes have a left and a right visual field. So it's not what you see with your right eye goes to your left hemisphere and what you see with your left goes to your right. It's what you see in the right visual field of your right eye and of your left eye will travel to the left hemisphere. Okay, and on the left side, it will travel to your right hemisphere. But both eyes have two visual fields, a left and a right. So what's happening is that information is being sent to one side of the brain and the communication doesn't happen because the corpus callosum is, is split. So if we do this to a split brain patient, they look at the word and we ask them, what did you see? They will say, I saw art. And that's what they consciously are able to tell you that they've seen. However, if you tell them to point with their left hand at what they saw, they point to the word he. The reason why, of course, is the ART part of heart has gone to the left hemisphere, which language and the conscious uh, understanding of that shows up. So they're able to say that. They are unaware that they saw the word he, but when they point with the left hand, it's getting information from that right hemisphere and they point to that word, although they don't realize that they've seen it, or at least they don't report that they've seen it. So it's quite interesting what happens to people. Uh, the other thing is this phenomena does go away after a period of time with these people. Um, what about the, you know, right and left differences when our brains are actually intact. Well, what's been really found is almost everything we do, your brain works in coordination with itself. There are almost everything, when we look in fMRI or PET scans, we involve both our left hemisphere and our right hemisphere in almost everything we do. Um, perceptual tasks predominantly on the right side, language predominantly on the left side, but we are using both sides of that brain. The um, Interest is with handedness is right and left. Uh, first of all, what is right and left handed? Because many people will, you know, eat with their right hand, use a fork, they'll cut with their left, or they'll they'll do the opposite, or you'll you'll throw a ball with your right, but you catch with your left. You might play uh, uh, hockey or field hockey with left handed, but you golf right handed. Um, so it it does kind of vary. Um, there are certain things where we find a predominant number of left-handed people. Baseball is one of them where we see there, but the specialization of the sport, they look for left-handers because there aren't as many of them. Uh, but we do see that in mathematics and other things as well. And you can look in your textbook for a list of the things where there actually are more people that are left-handed. Now, cognitive neuroscience uh, starts to look at what is happening inside your brain when we do things and we've noticed there's been patients that are actually there's not a lot of brain uh, they're, they're not uh, they've been injured and they are not conscious yet we tell them to think of things their body can't move they're paralyzed sorry they're conscious but they can't move their body and we tell them to think of you know like serving a tennis ball and we notice those circuits that are used just that them imagining it are lit up. It's like they're doing it. And you guys know in sports, then of you that play that visualization is an important thing. And when you visualize, it's actually like you are doing the actual task. So cognitive neuroscience spends time looking at that. We don't, what do we, when we visualize, is it just like doing something? And there's some interesting studies that I'll tell you about in class that have uh, come about from this. 
which leads us back to the dual processing with the left and the right hemisphere. We talked about dual processing in the memory unit and the two-track mind. The dual processing is there is processing going on in our unconscious that we're not even aware of. You know, for example, we looked at sight. When we see something, you know, we consciously are aware of what we see, but all the stuff that go going on beneath the scenes or behind the scenes in your brain, you know, we're processing the color, we're processing the form, we're processing the uh, depth, and we're processing movement all at the same time. And it's all done in kind of different parts of your brain. Um, this is why, like, if we look at these masks at the bottom of the page here, uh, we tend to see this inverted mask where you can put it in, where it's upside down, and it's actually uh, concave, convex. It sticks in, but it looks like it sticks out. That's how we perceive it. But, you know, if a fly lands in the middle of there, someone instinctually will reach in and flick, reach into the mask and flick the fly off, even though they don't perceive that. So there's other um, processing going on that we're not aware of blind sight is a very interesting thing where you know people with certain issues that don't allow them to really see the world yet they can manipulate their way around a maze or a room without bumping into things where they actually are processing and if you think of this the light energy has to go in through your eyes you know in through your thalamus the opt optic chiasm and there's processing going all along the way and until it reaches your visual cortex is where it creates that image. So even though that image isn't really there or is not accurate, all that other processing is happening and people with blind sight, they don't see, but it's like they can see, but they're not conscious of it. So this is what we mean by a two-track mind or, or dual processing. Uh, this is one thing that your mind, your brain and a computer uh, don't have in common. Computers are serial processors. They process as one thing at a time. However, your brain can process several things all simultaneously, and a lot of it's done on, our, on an unconscious level, but it all goes to leading us to help us live in it and manipulate our world. So we'll look at behavior genetics in this module, and you know what does make people different? When we talk about you know genetics and everything else, the genes are your blueprint for life, right? But how does heredity versus the environment uh, shape the way we are, how do things happen? So kind of the basics, you guys know about chromosomes. They're like the chapters in your, in your system that say who you're going to be. And you borrow 23 chapters from your biological mother and 23 from your biological father to have, you know, 46 chromosomes. Contained in the chromosomes is DNA and a slight, um, part of that is, is your genes. Okay. Your genes live on that double helix thing that you guys are probably aware of on the DNA. Uh, now genes can either be active or inactive. We call them expressed if they are active. So genes can be laid there and it's it's not like you're given a genetic code and this is exactly how it portrays itself. Um, there are chemicals and stuff produced in your body that will say whether or not these genes become active. So there you may have a pre-wired for something but it doesn't come to fruition unless the environment acts on it and causes those genes to become expressed. A genome is all of the genes that are available to us. So a human genome is all the genes we have. The Human Genome Project completed discovering all the genes belonging to the human species uh, back in 2003. Uh, now we're looking at how they combine, how we can use it for, uh, you know, to advance ourselves as, a, as, a, as human beings and use it for good. Um, the genes you contain is your genotype. Uh, how you express those genes, sorry, your genes is your phenotype, how, is it, how it is expressed, actually how they come, they, they make you look that way or be that way. So something that's really interesting, we have identical twins and fraternal twins, which really help us with these studies. Twin adoption studies and adoption studies are, are great for learning about nature nurture interaction. Of course, identical twins sometimes we call monozygotic because they actually have our one sperm, one egg that divides and continues to divide. So you are genetically identical to your identical twin. A fraternal twin is two eggs, two sperms, and they separate and they grow up and you, they are no different than any brother or sister. They share about 50% of their genetics. Okay, so they're just like any other brother and sister, but they're born on the same day. Identical twins are genetically the same. So wouldn't it be awesome you know, if we could separate the twins at birth and then bring them back together 
and find out what it is. It would be unethical. However, uh, just naturally, this has happened. And there's been experiments, for example, like the Minnesota twin study, where they have sought out twins that have been separated at birth that were identical and brought them together and compared all the things that they had in common. Uh, some of them are just amazing what they had in common. Like, for example, the, um, the person, you know, they have the same job, they have the same haircut, same mustache, they uh, have got married on the same day to a woman by the same name. They both have a dog that has the same name, the same kind of dog. It goes on and on. Those, and it's remarkable, uh, the similarities. But can we make that jump and say that that's all genetic? Well, probably not. Um, one of the criticisms, this is anecdotal evidence, and it's we brought them together looking for similarities. And we find out genetically, we are not a lot different from one another genetically. In fact, when we look at other species, um, chimps and stuff are uh, like 98% the same genes as we have. So all of the people in the world, we have very similar genes. We're not different by much, but a little difference can make a big difference in how it shows. So when we look at biological versus adoptive relatives, um, you know, we can take a, a child that's been adopted, maybe some of you have been adopted, and you've been raised in a family, and um, are you more similar to your adoptive parents, or are you more similar to your biological parents? Well, in some ways, you're probably more identical to your, or more, not identical, but more like your, uh, your biological parent. Sometimes genes can't be overridden. Um, our environmental relatives we grow up you know you think about this those of you that have brothers and sisters how different are you or how much the same are you you know like you you share a lot of the same genetics you share a very similar environment but probably your personalities and temperaments and everything else are quite different uh, in fact a lot of brothers and sisters that grow up in the same home at the same time have entirely different personalities you know so is it nature or is it nurture it's evidence that we can all put together that maybe your personality could be you were just born with that personality it's not the way you were brought up so stop blaming your parents for everything in fact we find a lot of things um, parents or children from the same families can have entirely different outcomes and we find that you know parents will probably often take too much blame for things that go wrong and often take too much credit for those things that go right so don't blame them. It's up to you. Know, it's you. It's how you were put together genetically and your environmental experiences that you've had. One of the new things we look at is molecular genetics. So molecular behavior genetics looks at, you know, how do these genes come to fruition? How are they expressed? Um, so molecular behavior um, might look at, you know, genes that we, we can identify that may cause problems later in someone's life. And in fact, we have identified genetic codes that makes someone susceptible to certain conditions that they are going to end up with, you know, which leads to the idea is would it be good if we could go into, you know, into that fetus and find these genetic combinations and actually change them at the time. It does lead to a lot of issues, legal and ethical. And I recommend you have a look at the Human Genome Project website and look at the, the legal and ethic, ethics parts of it because it's quite interesting. Heritability is one of the most misunderstood words. People have difficulty understanding it. What it means, people that study heritability to find those effects, the, the, uh, the, the molecular geneticists, um, it's difference among people. So it's, a, it's amongst the population how we can say, uh, how much can we explain the differences through genetics and how much can we explain through the environment. So for example, um, height is has a 90% heritability factor. But that doesn't mean you get 90% of your height from genetics and 10% from your environment. It means the differences among the population means that we can explain it 90% through genetics and 10% through environment. Uh, same thing with divorce. We find there's about a 50% heritability rate in divorce. Um, but again, it depends on the population. In one population, it may be a different heritability than in other populations. But heritability is difference among groups, not how much is genetic and how much is environmental. But it does give us an indication of how much heredity comes to play in a lot of situations. So 
your genes also will interact with the environment. In fact, they're one of the same things. You know, the question almost isn't, uh, you know, almost everything genes and environment play a, a role in that you guys know already. Uh, but it's it's bigger than that. It's how your genes interact with your environment and, and create that experience. The interaction between the two can change things. There's evocative interaction. So you may be a child that invokes warm feelings from your parents. So your parents are going to treat you in a way that are going to make you a certain way and you will have warm relationships with your parents and maybe other people. Where other people have genes that make them tough to deal with, they have a high temperament and they may evoke a different response from their parents which could lead to um, stressful situations which may invoke your dream genes to produce uh, situations where you can develop depression or something. So your genes and experience interact. Uh, you may be good looking, sociable and everything else. Your environment is going to be different than somebody who is less so than you. Uh, epigenetics is like going beyond genes and how they looking at how how do they express themselves and when do they express themselves? For example, this butterfly in situations, its genes make it turn green. But then when the other situations, uh, seasonal situations happen, its genetics change and make it turn brown. And it has to do with its environment changing its genes as far as that goes. Uh, which leads us to when we look at things that are similar amongst people. This is what evolutionary psychology looks at. And it's a big idea. Um, it, you guys know the work of, of Darwin and evolution. And uh, Richard Dawkins, a well-known Oxford uh, professor, uh, has said that Charles Darwin's idea of survival of the fittest may be the biggest idea ever we've ever had in history. I don't know, is it? It's up to you to decide. But we'll look, you know, at evolutionary psychology. Um, natural selection is undeniable that things will help us survive. And we look around the world, doesn't matter where we are, we have two eyes in front of our, you know, on the front of our face that work the same way. Uh, there's so many things we have in common. And again, we share many of the same genes that we have with people around the world. So it makes sense that those traits that are going to help us survive are going to make us pass on. You know, the not pass on, we're going to pass on our genes. So for example, you know, a, a gene that says we should be afraid of a deadly snake and not pet it, people with that genetic propensity are going to be able to pass on their genes more than the ones that think we're going to go pet any snake we can and end up getting bit and killed and they don't pass on their genes. So when we look at natural selection, we, we've done this in reverse. There, there was people that took uh, uh, wild foxes and they got them and they observed them and they found the most the, the nicest, the friendliest ones. And they judge them by, you know, how you go to handle them and how they would respond. And they would breed them together and so far down the line that eventually they got this very docile kind of fox that was just like a dog. It wanted to lick you and was your friend and wanted to be around you and whined when you were away, just like a regular house dog. Um, and actually when they were running out of money, they found a way to make money. They sold these foxes as pets. But it was because they they controlled the selection of this. Now, a mutation is something that happens randomly. A random mutation will be a change in the genetic material, and it could be something that helps us survive, and therefore it is more likely to be passed on. Mutations happen fairly frequently, but you know they're not always things that are going to be passed on or that are good for us. Okay, when we talk about survival of the fittest, it is not the strongest, most endurable animal. It's the one most suited to pass on its genes through the next ge generation. Maybe it's just some, you know, a gene that makes you live longer so you can have more offspring or have more childbearing years. Maybe it's because you are more able to seek food because of that genetic propensity or whatever. You know, you think about it, you know, almost everybody likes sweet food. Sweet food contains a lot of sugar or glucose and stuff that we burn for energy. So it's good to like it. Now we have such access to it that we have to be careful not to get too much of it. Um, genetic traits which helped us before may harm us today. Um, for example, we have gender differences in sexuality. Um, most studies suggest men have a stronger tendency towards sex. You know, we ask, you know, who thinks about sex more? Who masturbates more? Who... Um, 
who becomes more uh, sexually aroused more easily? The answer is always men. And that's in every culture. In fact, it's very few cultures or almost non-existent where the female is more likely to initiate sexual activity. Men are the ones that want to. And it makes sense in this respect that girls have much more invested in sexual activity because they're more likely to, they're going to incubate or gestate the child and they're going to feed the child and look after it. So when men females are looking for a partner they are more attracted to people that are going to be around more relationship kinds of ideas where men tend to be more attractive to uh, attracted to women that show youth youthful things that indicate good childbearing years to come uh, that's this is why young you know adolescent males are often more excited at older females and you know 26 27 year old males are more attracted to you know people around their own age and then older males are more attracted to younger because of the childbearing issues that that are there and it's it's just ingrained in us um, genetically I'm gonna have to explain this in class I really came out funny but it's what it is anytime you see something that we have an idea and then we work back and we make it fit it's called retrofitting and it's something that we could definitely be a little bit skeptical about okay so that's our biological basis of behavior and uh, next uh, we're going to look at sensation and perception okay so we'll see you guys in class make sure you understand this stuff again it's a very important unit bye for now